Hey, welcome to Lead Full. My name is Chesley Lunday. I am your host today. Here's the deal. We know that life, no matter how successful you are, can sometimes be an exercise in futility. And we want to help you defeat futility in your lives. We want to help you develop fulfillment and we want to help you change the world because we know this, when leaders are fulfilled, they fill the world with hope. Now, let's get ready to lead full. Today, we are interviewing Peyton Jones. He's one of my favorite pastors. And I know, obviously, if you are on this podcast, you're like, wait a minute, pastor? Yes. See, he believes that church can be done a little bit differently than it's been done in the past. And everything you thought you knew about Christianity, about following Jesus, there's probably a different way. And we'll get into that in the interview with Peyton. But he is the author of a few books, the author of Reaching the Unreached, Church Zero, and his new one, Church Plantology. It's a book for us church nerds, like this guy right here. But I think you'll find some pretty interesting information and even a little bit of wisdom. Get ready for my interview with Peyton. Hey, man. Thanks for joining us today. For everybody that just tuned in, this is Peyton Jones, um, kind of one of my heroes in the faith. I think I came across Church Zero while I was a church plant intern in Springfield, Missouri. That was a long time ago. And so... We have you here. You've written a couple more books since then, and we get to talk about that today. So I'm really excited. Nice, man. Well, hey, thanks for having me on here. I appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. But here's the other piece that probably you know most of my uh, most of my subscribers and listeners don't know. Um, well, you're you're a church planter, and we talk uh, young professional hustling, uh, missionally discontent, like uh, professional people that are just driven. Um, but we also like, you know, Star Wars and uh, nice. and comic books. I don't know if you can see my little Batman and Captain America back there. So see, this is why we're friends. You pick the best out of DC and the best out of Marvel. I know. Those are my two favorite superheroes. <laughs> Same. They, they, they are the equivalent. When they did yes. a DC Marvel versus, they teamed up Captain America and Batman to fight one another. Of course, Batman won. Yeah, Batman beats everyone every time. Of course. Yeah. You know, they, they had a video a few years ago with Darth Vader fighting Batman. And all my friends were like, yeah, we totally knew Darth Vader would beat Batman. And I was like, y- you guys are stupid. No. Batman will win. Like, that is his superpower. His superpower is he always wins. Because even if you beat the crud out of him once, he comes back. That doesn't happen twice. He's studying you while you're beating the crud out of him. Yeah. And then he comes prepared. He is the ultimate Boy Scout. He will come prepared. He will beat you next time. It's so true. The cool thing about Batman, uh, it, everybody's like, you know, uh, what? it was Justice League. I'm pretty sure that he's like, what's your superpower? He's like, I'm rich. But yeah. really... It's it's the <laughs> it's fact not. that he is super smart. <laughs> it is. I you know, I was disappointed by that answer. I was like, Yeah, that's a Hollywood take on Batman. It was it's funny. Not that he's rich. rich. It was funny. It was funny. It was but for funny. us fanboys, we're like, wait a minute, he's the world's greatest detective. Right. Uh, right. And I'm really hoping right. this next Batman movie actually shows that because none of the other ones have. Yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to that. You know, but I knew Justice League had a good movie hidden inside of it. And I, I, I my name is Peyton Jones, and I, I wholeheartedly approve the Snyder Cut. <laughs> there there we go. We've gone deep already. We've gone yes, deep. yes, we deep have. Controversial right away. That's how I like it. I think I posted that on Facebook. You said something about it, and my brother texted me. He's like, I got to admit, I completely disagree with you. I'm like, well, what's new, bro? <laughs> <laughs> So, but it's okay. It's great. So you are a church planter, and what that means is you start churches. You're like a viral church planter, though. You just, that's what you do. So talk yeah. a little bit about that. Talk about your story. I know you were in uh, Wales for a little while, and uh, we'd love to hear that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, my career kind of uh, is the backwards and downward. If you're playing shooting ladders, right, that kid's game, uh, the goal of that game is to go up the ladder and not go down the chute. Well, I started at the top, right? Like, quote, unquote. I, I, I don't really believe that. But, you know, when people are at the bottom of that board game, they're looking up going, I want to be up there. Well, I was at a church of thousands in Huntington Beach, California, right? Like, it was, it's everybody's dream, I suppose, or at least in the 80s and 90s it was. 
But God put this mission heart in me. Like I wanted to go where Christ wasn't named. I'll never forget looking out my office window, second story, and going, huh, I could see two church buildings from here. And I'm reading these radical biographies, J. Hudson Taylor, William Carey. Um, these guys are just given everything, you know, for, for mission. And uh, I know you speak to a lot of entrepreneurs and they'll, they'll of course understand when you got a mission, you got to go do it. And I had that and I had it bad. So it was like, I, I started feeling this call. In fact, the elders of the church at that time, I was the interim pastor. They were like, hey, you're our next pastor. And I said, I can only give you a couple of years here. Um, I'm called to go to Wales. Now, my ancestry was in Wales. I moved overseas. Um, here I had gone from a cushy position as a mega church pastor, a sermon factory, to suddenly being in the Dockside Presbyterian or Dockside Presbyterian Church in a steelworking town in Port Talbot. So um, it's not here. It's just see that right there. That's a scar. They, they, these are wrinkles. That's a scar. You can't see, but it's right over. It. My I, I can only grow part of an eyebrow. Do you see that? Yeah, um, yeah. Can't grow I, full eyebrow. I have the same problem. If you've noticed, there are actually two scars. One was a chair. One was a knife. And none of them you are do. as good as your story. None of them no, are as good as great. yours. <laughs> we're, we're, we're scar twins. But, you know, what, what happened was I got my head beat in. It was a rough place. And I went there um, to Martin Lloyd-Jones' church, served as the evangelist. 9-11 hit, and my support dropped in half. And I immediately ended up serving um, uh, in, a, in a factory, working for Sony in a dungeon um, on a conveyor belt. And after being there a year as the evangelist, I suddenly started realizing, holy crap, I am reaching more people here on this uh, conveyor belt um, in, in, in the canteen, on the, in this giant factory, working 12-hour shifts than I ever would as a full-time minister. And that started kind of this love journey with me and bivocationalism. So anyways, fast forward, I took a pastor in, in, a, in, in another town, worked as a firefighter for four years in Britain, then went on to become a barista, accidentally planted a church in the Starbucks, and just got addicted to church planning. Because church planning is when you're doing it right, you have no clue what you're doing. I, I mean, that's the biggest part about planning a church is... It's ground zero. That's where the title of Church Zero came from. Every time you start over, it's ground zero with the Holy Spirit. And so some people are like, hey, you're a church startup guy. I'm not. And I'll tell you why. There's a difference between church starting and church planning. Church starting is when you start with the church in mind. I, I, I couldn't really give a, a rip about church planning. And that weirds people out, particularly ministers. But I'm a church planner. Church planners and ministers are two different animals. When you have a, a minister, he's thinking church. It's all about the church. It's about the machine. It's about the empire. When you're talking to a church planner, they're like, it's about people. Because now, uh, don't get me wrong. There are pastors and, and ministers out there that love people. They are shepherds to the core. So I don't mean that to be too oversimplified. But you know what I'm talking about. Have, I'm describing two different approaches, really. Um, and, and when you're a church planner, <clears throat> It's about the mission. So you'll work as a firefighter. You'll work as a barista. There's what you're made for and what you're paid for. And planting became my mission. So I, 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 I would work at whatever job. I've been a clinical troubleshooter. I have an RN background. Been a psych I've been all these different things to enable me to continue to reach people that are far away from God. And that gets addictive. You know, some people get addicted to tattoos. Other people get addicted to church planting, and I, I think I'm, <laughs> I think I'm addicted to church planting. But, anyways, all that to say, um, church church planting starts with the gospel and people, and you just get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do His thing. Um, church starting is hard. I don't think I could start a church, but I can plant. Pl planting is what happens when you're doing discipleship and evangelism and just meeting people where they're at, entering their rhythms, depending on the Holy Spirit. I could do that stuff, right? Because I'm not the mover and shaker. I'm a, I'm a spectator in that. And that, that's what I tried to train people, to be honest, is, yeah. That's, that's really amazing. I, as I'm listening to you, this might be the first time some of these young professionals, some of these uh, go-getters and entrepreneurs are sitting there going like, wait a minute, that's...
very different than what I have heard about church or what I've experienced. And you said there's what I'm made for, what I'm paid for, and somebody's like, wait a minute, you're not talking organizationally, you're talking something very different and something that maybe even we could do <laughs> that's not a pastor of a you know huge organizational church. Uh, like, tell me a little bit more about yeah. uh, what your kind of philosophy is and how that could work in, as an entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, Paul, the Apostle Paul was an entrepreneur. I mean, this is the great thing about him, right? He, before he became a missionary, he was a tent maker. He came from a family business of tent making. Um, he, and tent making, by the way, picture, if, if you want to go into a business in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, it's really hot in the Mediterranean. I've been there a lot, and it gets really, really warm. So uh, think of awnings, right? Because you would go hang out on your roof. Everybody needed tents. The sun is really hard on tents. So Paul was a tent maker. Everybody needed what he was buying. So he would go into the marketplace, and he would just work with his hands. Now, he's in a marketplace, right? That is where you meet people. It's the biggest, weirdest uh, anomaly in the Christian world that we take our ministers, they're meant to be on the front line, and we put them in a cubicle, nine to five, right? The average, your listener will meet more people uh, by 12 o'clock lunchtime on a Monday uh, than a minister will in an entire week, possibly an entire month. It would be like if we were, you know, whatever sport you want to say, that you're such a, you're like the Wayne Gretzky of the hockey world. That's going back a bit, right? Or you're the, you know, the the goat. The Michael you know, Jordan. Uh, yeah, you can go Michael yeah, Jordan. Yeah. Uh, no and, matter. And we'll go Michael, Michael Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. You're, 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 you're Michael Jordan. And we go, oh, you're so good. You know what we need to do for you is we need to take you off the court and have you over here with these meetings where you meet all the time with people that are interested in basketball. And you just talk about it because no, who knows basketball more than you? But we don't let him in the game anymore. And so for me, what Paul did, um, Paul, Paul did something. This is really interesting. Paul not only used entrepreneurial terms in, in the letters he wrote, like in Ephesians, he says, make the most of every opportunity. Um, that's, that's the term that we translate that in English. But actually what Paul is saying literally in the Greek is, because it was written in Greek, for those of you that are new and, and aren't into church or the Bible and you don't know what I'm talking about, literally in the Greek, Paul says, buy up the best bargains for the gospel. In other words, what he's saying is, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's like, well, you know, I want to I want to buy low and I want to sell high and I want to make the profit. Paul's saying there is a way to be strategic, right, about how you do ministry. For me, the most strategic thing was getting out and around people. And you ask my philosophy. It's really funny. I do what Paul did. Paul started churches where there were none. So he would start with people who didn't go to church. So my very first church plant was in a Starbucks. Dan Brown Da Vinci Code had come out. And I was working as a barista, finishing up an MA degree in theology, getting ready to come home. And people come through the bar, and they would say, hey, what's your accent from? I'd talk to them. They'd say, well, what are you doing over here in Wales, of all places? And I'd say, well, you know, guess what I am. And they, they, they would guess ballerina. They would guess um, all kinds of different things, which was wrong. And if you're looking at me, you know I'm not a ballerina. But... What what in, eventually I would tell them I was a pastor and they'd be like, man, I would come to a church if 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 you had a church, I come and I'm like, yeah, no, no, I'm I'm just heading back to America. And when they knew I wasn't selling them something, because uh, when you hear someone's a minister, it's kind of a threat. Oh, he's going to want me to go to his church, yada, yada. You know, it's always about feeding the machine. Right. He wants my money. And I always work with my hands. I never got paid for ministry. And, and that kept it honest, right? People knew he's not after me for my money. And, and in fact, I was like, I don't want anything from you, but I, I do want you to know God. And I know God loves you and I want him to know you. And if we could take that whole like seedy, weird, trippy part out of it, where like people are like, oh, here we go. If people, people are open if they know you're sincere. And so eventually they'd be like, well, what do you think about Dan Brown Da Vinci Code? So I had to read it. Because I got that question. It was bestseller. So we threw a, a reading group. On the first night, 30 people turned up. Now, these were unchurched Europeans. I couldn't have gotten 30 unchurched Europeans in a room to talk about Jesus if I tried in a churchy thing. Neutral venue. Um, this became 
I'm going to do what Paul did. I'm going to go into their space. I'm not going to ask them to come into my space. I'm going to talk about things they're interested in. I'm not going to have them talk about what I'm, I'm really interested in God. But I realize the average person out there isn't, and, and sometimes for good reason. So what happened was second night, because they, they asked, hey, can we do this again? I had no plan to do it a second night. So I said, oh, you know, I mean, no, that would, I remember saying, these are my exact words. Uh, this isn't the way for all these entrepreneurs. They know. They're like, you're a dummy. Uh, uh, my response was, no, nah, it'd be lame. Why would we do that? I mean, we, we kind of nailed that book tonight. They're like, no, this is great. I've never heard these things before. Let's talk again. Okay, so we met second night. Then we met third night. At the third night, this, this woman uh, kind of acting like she had just discovered the most punk rock concept on the planet said, hey, you know how Dan Brown had like those phony gospels? What if we read like the real gospels? And she said, you know, like, like the gospel of Mark. I was looking through the Bible. I picked one up last week and, and I started looking through. And everybody, I kid you not, this is like 50 by this third week, unbelieving, unchurched Europeans. And they started to go, yeah, could we do that? Like, and I'm just thinking, you guys just asked to start up a church. Like, so, so to me, my philosophy is, um, do what Paul did, start it up with people that don't go to church. And I'll tell you, it, it's so fun when people have no clue, there's no baggage. It was great. And, and I'm addicted to that. It's really awesome. I, uh, I know you just wrote a book called Church Plantology <laughs> and um, the art and science of planting churches, basically starting churches. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, this book, it was funny. I, I wasn't even sure I was going to keep talking to church planters. So I'm a little long in the tooth. I'm 47 years old. Um, I think it's time. I, I love, Chesley, that you're, you're younger. I love your generation. Your generation, like this is where I'm, I'm Gen X. If I need something done, I go to the millennials or below, man. Like your, your generation is that they get a reputation from old fuddy-duddies of being slackers and this and that. It's not true. Because I've served along, because of the stuff I do in the church, I serve with your generation repeatedly. Um, but I was like, you know, it's time for me to move aside. Let a younger guy get in there. I mean, I'm I'm at the age now where it's like, man, there's there's got to be guys like in their 30s that were like I was, and they need to be heard now. I think, and and literally, that's what'll happen. Watch me this year. I'll be pulling out of this game a little bit because I want to use my platform to empower that next generation. I don't need to be heard. I've had a 10 year run. It's been fun. It's been great. But this book is actually kind of like my swan song to it. Like, like this is my piece on war, right? Like this is, yeah, you're not is, supposed to write that until you're 80. <laughs> right. Right. Well, you know, I actually apologize in it. Because to me, it's like, you know, you're, you're talking to entrepreneurs. No entrepreneur, even successful entrepreneurs, they don't feel like they got it cornered. They, you know, all of them will say, I'm, I, I had a lot of luck and I had hard work. And that there's this mix. I don't think it's that much different in, in church planning. You, you, you work hard. I've actually got a whole subject on your work ethic. If you're going to do this, you're going to work hard. You work hard or nothing hardly works. But at the same time, you know, for, for whether it's, it's, you know, maybe in a secular uh, field, someone would say, I was very lucky. I read a lot of biographies from people and they'll always say, I was lucky. I was fortunate. I was, there's that gratitude component. And for me as a Christian, I've always felt like, okay, God turned up. He was there for me. I don't see it as luck, but um, I do believe that God works, whether you're a Christian or not, God works in your life, even before you know him. If that, if that were not true, I would not be here. And that so, is so a some foreign of, so concept some of, to most church people, right? Man, right, that, right. Yeah. Well, this, this is the thing, right? Like, like Jesus, when he came, and by the way, remember religious people kill him, right? So he was not a part of the, the system. people he's pissed off at are the religious Absolutely. people. <laughs> and, and Jesus kept talking about the kingdom, not the church as they knew it. He talked about this thing called the kingdom, which he says is spiritual. It's from heaven. It's among you. And you don't realize it. He tells all these parables about this is, this is what the kingdom is doing right now. Like he talks about prostitutes and tax collectors. Well, my last church in urban Long Beach had guys from MS-13. We had, you know, lesbian strippers, prostitutes, transgender prostitutes. I mean, that church, I would, my neighbors would be like, what's your church like? And I'd be like, look, it's a church Jesus would actually go to. 
right? It's just filled with all the people that you, you're my neighbor, but you wouldn't want to live next to the people um, that, you know. That, all the people that, that, that know how to throw church. a party, though, let's be honest. <laughs> right, right. But, but Jesus would talk about the kingdom, and the kingdom, he kept on almost all of his parables, he talks about the kingdom working out there. So, like, when we see things like um, justice issues out in society, and maybe the church is slow to catch on to that. Um, we we got to remember that the church at its greatest in the 20th century was under Martin Luther King Jr. Um, that was kingdom of God. Now, the church was out in the forefront, but the marginalized church was out in the forefront of that. It was radical. Jesus was a radical. So here's the thing is that um, the kingdom often is way ahead of the church. It's God working in the world without people gumming it up in the middle. Now, God loves to work through his people. He loves to work, but the church is often behind where the kingdom of God is at. So when I see things like justice issues and all that, I'm like, that's the kingdom of God at work in the world. That is actually God's heart towards people, towards uh, these issues. And you see that playing out. And, and so where I'm at with church planning is I'm trying to keep pace with the kingdom of God. I'm out in the borders of where I think God really works, right? Um, you start reading my books, you start, I'll tell stories about, hey, I walked into this one house. This one was a recluse for 12 years. She had an Allen on prayer book, had no idea who Jesus was. I walked into her living room and the presence of God filled it. And I, as a missionary, was a little scandalized, like, whoa, wait a second, God. <laughs> yeah. I bring this. You know, that was when I was a new missionary. That's what I thought. I thought I brought that. And God was like, Peyton, you've been playing in the whitewash. There's a vast ocean of things I am doing out here in people's lives. They're going to find me. They're going to know me. And I'm working. And of course, we see that in the Bible. Cornelius. Cornelius is trying to figure it out. He's this Roman centurion. He doesn't understand what he's so He's like giving money to the local synagogue. He's trying to do good things for people. He's trying to give back into the community. And God tells Peter, hey, get over there. That guy's trying to find me. He doesn't know where to look for me. And that's the joy of what I do. Yeah, so this is a very, uh, it's not a new concept of church, right? This is 2,000 years old. It's, but It is Christianity. It's at its heart before yeah, it's gunked up by people. But it's innovative. And so you're like, hey, I'm a church planter. Obviously, we believe the church is the people of God, not a building, not an organization. But um, how, does, uh, how does church keep pace with the kingdom? What would that look like? How how would you even organize? Like, what what does that look well, like? Well, I'm glad you asked that. I've got this little book called Church Plantology. And actually, it, it is largely about this. I actually, I talk about planting from burden. So like some of your listeners who would be like entrepreneurial, but they're they're um, socially aware entrepreneurs, um, you know, they might, they might think, man, kids in Africa need drinking water or, you know, whatever. It starts with a burden. And um, it's funny because your generation, again, there's something special about your generation. I always think your generation would make the best missionaries. You're not as materialistic. Let me, can I, can I analyze you guys for a second? Yeah, that'd be great. You're, you're, we already you get analyzed. Yourself? It's usually on the lean, wrong side of the lean, <laughs> lean, lean back on my sofa. You know, uh, let's talk about your mother. No, let's, um, let's chat for a second because your generation, it was really interesting. I talked about 9 11. I was overseas when that happened. I was in my late 20s. I was a freshman um, in high school. <laughs> right. So you guys, my second you freshman know, year because, you know, I'm not that smart. <laughs> I like you. Um, the the generation that lived through that in their developing years, the world turned upside down. So sometimes I'll hear, oh, this generation, bunch of pot smokers, bunch of weaklings, bunch of... We did not have that. The worst thing that happened in my generation was a space shuttle blew up. So, uh, and that was trippy. Like, I will never forget where I was when that happened. Um, but at the same time, 9-11 was just a hundred to a thousand times more catastrophic and your guys reality your whole gener everything turned upside down five years later the bottom of the economy fell out so when i see like your generation not as materialistic tiny houses you know i get it i'm like that's rad and and when i started looking because i love studying the movements of god in history 
um, where like the hippies, you know, all came to, to, to Jesus and droves. Cause like we were talking about him being a radical, they related to him and they're like, okay, this Jesus is nothing like this suit and tie 1950s Christianity that we're seeing with the, the old wax on the butch cut, you know, and the station wagon with the collie and the poor kids and the, you know, it, it was, it was no, I think Jesus was more like us than, than, than we realize but they were also hungering for truth and they found in Jesus something very different. Well, I think your generation, if they connected with Jesus, I actually think that your generation would be unstoppable um, because of that lack of materialism and because of uh, their hard work ethic. And, but that social burden, that burden for others, loving God and loving your neighbor. Jesus is like pretty much all the law. Here's the dummy's guide to the law. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love other people. Now that's hard. That's hard to do. <laughs> but you guys have something in you where you care about people. My generation, Gen X, our hallmark is we don't give a rip about people, right? So to see that, it, you know, what I talk about is, is connecting to that burden. I see God in that. I see God in when I look at a community and... I can't just turn away. I look at that community and I, and I moved with compassion. That is because I am made in the image of God and that's how God feels. And when I look at people in those communities, they made in the image of God. I, I, I see there's, there's value in that, you know, evolution doesn't tell you, you know, why that would happen, you know, but the fact that we are created beings, that we have souls, that we are spiritual, those things, those, that's what's happening. I'm, I'm feeling a piece of God's heart. And so again, if you're entrepreneurs that are, that are socially uh, conscious, they are literally, I believe, experiencing God, even though they may say, well, I don't believe in God, right? Like, you know, the fact that you believe in him or not, doesn't really matter whether or not you're going to experience him. You can still be experiencing him. That might, that might piss you off a bit, but you're experiencing God, my friend, because you're made in his image. That was placed in you by a God who loves and cares for the world. So, um, but I talk to planners about planning from burden. You know, you, when you can't look away from something, that's the right reason to plan a church. Not because you're like, you know, I kind of need some disposable income or I think I'd like to start a church, you know, that's not a good enough reason. You know, it, it has to be this burden that comes. And I, and I go into that in the book in, in detail. So I hear you say this and I am thinking as an entrepreneur, like this is a whole different model. It's like an upside down model of what everything has been done up till now. Um, would you say that you could literally build a business that is at the same time, a church planting machine? And I don't mean that's machine. what I'm doing next. Yeah. So, so it's funny you say this because there's a really good book um, called Gospel Patrons, um, which it, it kind of chronicles throughout church history that every time a movement um, in history, uh, like the translation of the Bible into the English language, you know, it was in Latin. It was actually, you were killed. You were put to death if Wycliffe, you tried right? to translate. Yeah, yeah Wycliffe. Wycliffe yeah. So Wycliffe had a guy named Monmouth who was a merchant who dealt with ships. So what he had to do was get a printing press. I think he got it from like Germany or something. He shipped it over. He shipped all the paper. He, you know, you couldn't arouse suspicion and he delivers it to a harbor, sets up a secret workshop so that, uh, Wycliffe can, can mass produce his Bible in the English language. language. We're um, not talking um, about Wycliffe, John, for all of you guys, this is like a dude back in the what? 1500s. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, and you know, these guys, they just wanted the people they wanted, they wanted to get the Bible into people's hands. So if you've seen book of Eli, right, where the bad guys wanted it, you know, to, to manipulate people. Well, these guys were the opposite. They were like, Hey, people are being manipulated by not knowing what's in this and being told by a very select few, this is what God wants. And Wycliffe was like, if people could read this for themselves, they would just be able to you know, not be manipulated. So they'd be like, Hey, this, is, that's what the reformation was. The reformation was sola scripture is the, 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 it, it revolutionized everything. So, um, and I, th I think most of us in today's world would see that as a good thing, you know, but, but, you know, so every time stuff happened throughout church history, um, there's usually an entrepreneur behind it, believe it or not. Um, you know, who, who was, 
used by God in that way to kind of get behind the movement as well and fund it or, you know, like Paul. I mean, in, in the book, I actually advocate what we call bivocationalism, where you're called to ministry and called to business. And, um, and I've been bivocational for most of my ministry, so I'm, I'm addicted to that. But, um, but Paul hooks up with two entrepreneurs um, in the first century, Priscilla and Aquila. It's a husband and wife team. They have a tent-making empire. Paul goes to work for him in Corinth. He gets the snot beat out of him on a second missionary journey. They stone him. He has to go somewhere. He's recuperating. He's been locked up in, in Ephesus. So he's rough. Like it, it, it actually seems when you study it, like Paul is just like almost like a, a breakdown. Like I can't go any further. And he recuperates for a year and a half in Corinth. Meanwhile, the guys that he's been, he's been traveling with some young men that are uh, coming along behind him, doing the ministry. And while Paul's working with them, he's just resting and working with his hands. Well, what happens through Priscilla and Aquila is um, we know that from the writings of the Bible, they had a house in Ephesus, Corinth, and Rome. In fact, they're in Rome when Paul writes the book of Romans. Um, he greets them there. Now, to have a home back then, you were rich, right, in those cities. Like, most people didn't have homes um, that they owned, but it says they, the church met in their house, right? Each, each part, it talks about the church meeting in their house. So they had a big house, right? Um, and they were very wealthy. But what they did is they employed, Paul mentions, 32 missionaries. So what Paul was actually doing, this is pretty rock and roll. People don't realize this. What Paul was doing to spread the gospel was he was training bivocational church planters. He was training them in tent making so that they could go anywhere to anyone at any time. And the bottleneck wasn't money. The mission could just fro flow freely. And so fast forward this to, um, there was a book I read a few years ago called Stacking the Deck by Guy Fance, and that's P-F-A-N-Z. Guy Fance was a church planner who, uh, as he was getting ready to plant, uh, this, gosh, is amazing how this conversation's kind of come in full circle, but um, a lot of down and outs started coming to this coffee shop they had attached to their, their, their meeting space. And uh, the church people got mad and were like, hey, this, we're, we didn't pour our money into this to make it a homeless church. And he said, well, this is, this is who God is bringing, so uh, let's just keep ministering to them. Well, they basically pulled out and said, good luck without our money. And so Guy Fans had to find real quick, uh-oh, you know. Well, he had this cappuccino machine that broke. So he went on the internet, Internet 1.0, and uh, found how to fix a cappuccino machine. Netscape, and, uh, before Google. It. And then, that's it. Well, then to make money, because... You know, now he can't, he doesn't have a way to make a living and homeless people aren't paying for their coffee when they come in. He had to start repairing other people's coffee machines. So he starts making the rounds around a city. And um, one of the guys in my church plan network was trained by Guy Fance. So it's kind of cool. So I know a little bit more about it. Um, but what happened was uh, he went to this one place and this guy said, hey, uh, you know, you're repairing coffee machines. Um, have you ever thought about getting into roasting coffee? Uh, it was the early 90s, right? Like this is this is when all this started, you know, in, in America. It was just the cutting edge thing. Sounds funny to say now. But uh, so he did. He bought a, well, he said, oh, man, how much are those? The guy said they're $15,000 for a roaster. He was like, I can't afford one of those, right? I only got homeless people and I'm not making enough repairing coffee machines. Um, so one day an envelope drops on his counter with his name on he opens up there's 15 grand so somebody had a heart for homeboy to get a, a coffee roaster so he buys a coffee roaster well meanwhile these people they're reaching people from addiction this and that they're getting on their feet they're stepping up they start working for him when he starts roasting coffee now he's training them he's getting them off the street right now he's starting to give them a step up which is what we did in refuge long beach right um, then, and we did it through working with a, a local, uh, entrepreneur who, if you look up, um, American muscle grills, AMG grills, that's the guy that helped us. And he would give them forklift license and stuff like that. But what happened was, um, he, uh, st started roasting, like buying more and more roasters with the profits. And what he would do is he would let, and you, you'll know this more than I will, but, uh, he would let these guys, he would train them in ministry and church planning by day and have them roast coffee at night. Or maybe it was the other way around. But he started creating an empire. So when I tell you one of the guys in my network was was a part of that, 
he went up to Michigan out of there and planted a church with a coffee roaster. Because what would happen is you would eventually, after working there, you bought into a coffee roaster. You would, yeah, eventually, you would eventually own, own that coffee, coffee roaster. roaster. And you basically and franchise out. He franchised it out. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. So it's not surprising to hear that in the first century, entrepreneurship and the gospel went together. Hey, before we get back to the rest of the interview, I want to take a short break to tell you a little bit about something that I am doing with a team of mine, and that is called King City. King City is a new all-digital church that is about helping you develop fulfillment in your life because actually we believe that if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, that no matter the amount of success you have, it's all futile in the end anyways. And we believe in defeating futility. But here's the deal, because it's digital, we're not gonna have a building, we're not going to be looking for people to pay for the mortgage or the lights right away, but we do need people that say, you know what, I am all in for some sort of new church that is all about reaching people for Jesus and helping people develop fulfillment and reach their potential so that they can change the world. What does that mean? That means you need to text me and we need to get on a Zoom call together. So let's do that, all right? The number is 480-531-9015. I will love to meet you. Now, enough of me talking. Let's get back to the interview. That is amazing, that is amazing. And you basically lay out the roadmap in church plantology of, hey, this might be the new way. So let's, uh, we've got a few. The new way is always the old way. You're yeah, right. The well, yes, the there is nothing true, new no, under right. the sun, but it is new today. It's so. new today, which is so weird, right? Like, but you know this, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir with you. So, so it's good. I, I don't know. It gets me freaking fired up. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, yeah. We've we got a few minutes left. Uh, I would love for you to kind of uh, pull back the curtain a little bit and talk about what you're seeing. What does the future of church look like? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny because when I look at the church, I see us as, as fragmented. Um, in a way, it's kind of cool. It's like when you go to... Um, you know, the, I'm going to use a funny illustration. It's like when you go to the nut section in the supermarket, you know, and you got your, your cashew bin and you got your almond bin and you got your peanut bin and you got your, uh, sunflower seed bin and, and, uh, maybe you got some fruit, you got some cranberry bin and you got some raisin bin and you got all these different bins with a little scoop and you're not supposed to eat them, but you do. And, uh, what happens in the church is that we've got these different bins, right? Like, if I want to experience more of the Holy Spirit, I might go to a charismatic bin. If I want to experience deeper teaching, I might go to the reform bin. If I want to experience greater communion, I might go to the missional community bin, right? I, I see the, Ephesians. Or if you want to experience chapter, all of them, you can come start churches with me. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Yeah. Well, that's where I'm going because, because when I look at the church, I just, you know, it's like, which one? right? There is one church biblically, right? We are all part of the body of Christ, but there's different flavors, different types of nuts is how I like to put it. But when I plan a church, I don't want people to have to get deeper teaching at a reformed church. I don't want them to have to experience the Holy Spirit at the charismatic church. Um, this book is a pest, which if you don't know that term, everybody, that that's what I just described. There's different flavors in Ephesians 4. Um, Paul breaks down Christ's ministry into five parts, right? He was apostolic, which means missionary. Um, he was prophetic, which meant there's a little bit of supernatural. So for those of you that don't believe in God, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have seen supernatural things. I mean, I've, I'm a missionary. I, that's what I've seen. I don't believe in the weird stuff you see on TV. I think that's a bunch of hocus pocus and bunk. But I was a psychiatric nurse once upon a time, and I have been in exorcisms. And let me tell you, there's a big difference between schizophrenia and a demonically possessed person. So that's probably more than what people expected on your podcast today. <laughs> but, it's um, good. Um, uh, well, as a church, so I was replanting a church in Omaha, Nebraska, and there was this, uh, you're trying to relaunch it all and do all the rebranding and just was not going well. And I remember, I'm just like, I'm done. I'm done. And I get this. In the morning, I'm about ready to turn in my resignation. I get this uh, Facebook message, and it's from a pastor I haven't seen in seven years. I haven't talked to him, nothing. And he's like, God told me to pray for you last night, and uh, this is what he has to say for you. You are not done. You will not hang up. 
you will keep going and I will work through you. And I'm like, mm. uh, what, what category so do you put that in? <laughs> right. Right. And I mean, you know, so, so all of these kinds of things, you know, then, then it goes on to evangelist. Um, the evangelist, by the way, is, um, uh, they're they're the ones that that cheese everyone off. But you have evangelists, right? In the business world, we use some of these same terms, right? Actually, um, uh, Apple uses the term evangelist for their products, right? Right. Mission statement. I mean, all of this came from the church. So so it's really interesting. But like, uh, then you have a shepherd. That's the touchy feely. Those are the HR people. And then um, lastly, you have the teacher, right? So so you've got these different. Uh, ministries of Jesus. He was all five of those combined. And what Paul says is, look, uh, uh, when Jesus ascended, he he gave these functions as a gift to the church. So I tend to be more apostolic. I am I am very much a missionary in, in everything I do. Um, but if I'm left alone, it's my church, like a business, would take on my style. And, and unfortunately, that's not a good thing because God means all five of these different styles to work as a team. So I'm very much into team leadership. So when I plan a church, I have an opportunity of bringing these five different types of leaders together to plant because I don't want it to have my flavor. I want it to have Christ's flavor. And Christ is all those things. He's a teacher. He's a shepherd. He's prophetic. He's, he's mission driven. He's evangelistic. He's all those things together. And in balance, people see more of Jesus. So if I look at the future of the church, to me, I do see church planning as probably the greatest hope of the church. This textbook is unique because it's an apest approach to church planning, which from reading Church Zero, that would not surprise you. Yeah, no, definitely not. So funny thing is, um, I, you you probably don't know this, Peyton, but maybe some of the entrepreneurs or business managers, leaders out there, there's a, there's a company called Giant that they wrote a book called The Five Voices. Well, um, one of the guys that wrote that co-wrote that book also co-wrote a Christian book called uh, Building Discipleship, called Discipling Cultures with a guy named Mike Breen. Mike Breen, um, yeah. And, and so this five voices approach is literally <laughs> um, the APES model out of Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. It's really interesting. There's another, it's funny because um, Alan Hirsch, who's a theologian and missional practitioner that I greatly respect, um, I do a little bit of work with him. He, he and a businessman put together something called the impact assessment because team leadership is definitely the thing of the future. I mean, that's, yes. that's definitely. Yeah, I think it, even, in, even in entrepreneurial circles, it seems to be moving in that direction. And it's I M, or is it M P A C T assessment? Just I just discovered it like a week or two ago, but it literally they'll come into your team and they'll assess your team because what Alan Hirsch is theologian, theologian, missional practitioner on on everything I was just talking about. What he says is, look, because this is who Jesus was, back it up a bit. Jesus is God. That is also who God is. And because of that, we're made in his image. We these five, he calls it five Q. It's like uh, IQ. Um, these different types of uh personalities and things are found like would you not see like because the apostolic is more like the, the entrepreneur like the mission driven he says we have all this we have pioneers we have any he, he, inventors we have all these people that you know break boundaries the rebels he goes then you have this and he'll say in the church this is what it looks like but it's out there hardwired into the fabric of the universe um, because God made the universe in his image. So you find these things out there. So that's, again, one of those cool kind of mind-blowing things. Like, you're experiencing God whether or not you, you believe in him because you're living in his world. <laughs> yes. um, Paul quoted a Greek poet that says, In him we live and we move and we have our being. Have our right? Being. Well, guess what? That that is every last one of us, whether we like it or not. So, Absolutely. it's cool. Hey, where do we find you? Like, where do we? Um, obviously, you are a church planter, but it seems like you probably have a lot of wisdom that even my leaders could uh, glean from. What? Where would we get that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I have a website called ministryninja.com, and it, our, our tagline is to help you think, act, and develop into a, a ministry ninja. So we, we, we have articles on thinking, videos on thinking, 
uh, things about action, and then lastly, personal development. And uh, we are trying to change some of the conversation. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to have some of your people uh, clicking into that because I think there is crossover. There is crossover. Oh, I know there is. That's the whole goal of this podcast. We believe when you're fulfilled that you as a leader, fulfilled leaders, which we know is only found in Jesus and developed through uh, practices uh, like spiritual practices and community. And when we're on mission together, when that happens, we bring the hope of the world, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm really excited to help develop that. And guys like you, like, really appreciate what you guys are doing, you and Pete, over. They, you got a podcast still, too, right? Yeah, we've got um, Church Planner Podcast. Now, here's something to know. My co-host is not a minister. He is an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur. And it's kind of like Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin, where uh, I don't know if I'm the clown or he's the clown. One of us is the straight guy. Uh, or neither of us, I don't know, but we, uh, we goof off, but it is, it is so enriched and I think scandalized people over the years. Certain people dig us and like us because it's not a minister, typical minister. It's real people in the trenches with real people. Um, and it's just fun, but yeah, he's an entrepreneur. He's not a minister. Yeah. And you can tell, and it's great because you need, you need that voice. And so really excited about that. Well, man, I appreciate the time that you gave to us today. Uh, it was a great conversation. I wish we had longer because, man, I, I'm just eating it up. So cool, man. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it, brother. And they can also, if they do want to get the book, it's not cheap. It's 35, but it is nearly 500 pages in hardcover. Most of my books retail at 17, but this thing, it's a textbook actually. So, uh, but it's not a boring textbook, I promise. Uh, but it is $35. But uh, if you go to churchplantology.com, you can find a way to get some discounts there. And churchplantologybook.com, if you don't remember that, but either one will take you there. One of the most fun writers I have ever read. Um, you infuse Jesus, Mission, and Star Wars, and Indiana Jones, and yeah, man, that's really, really good. So yeah, support Peyton. His book actually comes out today when this launches. So go, go buy it. Make him a bestseller. Man, that was a great interview. I'm so fired up. Thanks, Peyton, for being a part of this today. Hey, be sure to check out Peyton and Pete on Church Planner Podcast. Yes, that is a lot of peas, and I'm probably popping right in your ear right now. But hey, it's great, right? Also, get Peyton's new book, Church Plantology, on Amazon today or wherever you decide you want to buy books at. Um, today, our soapbox segment is on something that Peyton said. It was a great line. He said, there's what you're made for, and then there's what you're paid for. Man, I love well, what I'm paid for is aligned and congruent with what I'm made for. But for so many of us, that isn't always the case. We might be great at what we're paid for, but we're still struggling to see where we can leave a lasting legacy. And isn't that what it is all about? It seems that significance and legacy is what we're all striving to reach and attain. The money's great, but what we really want is our lives to mean something. And that's what I loved about Peyton's story of Guy Fance. He knew the mission of God was calling him to reach a segment of the population that was underserved, and he was willing to take a punishment for it, right? People left because they didn't like the fact that he wanted to get a little messy. And so he still went after it. And that entrepreneurial zeal helped not hurt him along the way. So many times my experience with church, and I hope this isn't yours, but I'm guessing there's a lot of you that this is the truth. Church is an experience that communicates that the entrepreneurial talents and gifts aren't welcome unless it's promoting the brand of the lead speaker. I wasn't gifted an opportunity to use my gifts until I was in a space with the team that gave me the green light to use them. But times are changing. And that's so awesome. In a world where disruption occurs daily before lunch, we need more people like you who are called to rise to the challenge and solve the world's problems. God gifted some of the people in his kingdom with the gift of starting new movements and starting new businesses and starting new things with the sole purpose of changing people's lives. Yes, your business is not about the product that you're selling and if you don't believe me, look at marketing. Marketing is all about if you buy my product, product, we'll get you back 
to the Garden of Eden before sin showed up. That's always what it's about. It's always about getting back to perfection. You mark it every day because at the end of the day, you know that business is about making the world a better place. And yet we have the best product on the planet. It's a relationship with Jesus. It's the kingdom of God coming to them. And your business can be solely about that. Even if you're selling, you know, the next best cappuccino machine, because, you know, cappuccino is great. You see, the first Jesus followers called these people apostles or sent ones. And it was similar to the Roman emperor's uh, term for envoys who were called out and tasked with building an official government headquarters in the city they were assigned to. Often, when you looked at how the first Jesus followers accomplished this, it was through business, not a religious building like a church. And thousands of years later, half a world away, we are assigned to the same tasks. Maybe that's your calling. Just a thought. Hey, next week we have season 18 voice contestant Zan Fiskum going to be on the show. For all of you creatives out there, I can't wait for you to hear Zan's story. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe and like the video. Or if you are listening, please subscribe or follow to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you're listening from. And don't forget to rate and review us. Remember, that it is up to you to develop fulfillment because there is a world out there that needs you and fulfilled leaders fill the world with hope. That interview was fire, right? Peyton is amazing. He's a lot of fun. I love the Star Wars references. I love the jokes. He's just a great dude. Check out his book, Church Plantology. Even if you're not a church planter, I think you'll find it really interesting. Hey, thank you for listening to our interview today. We're so excited to be able to bring these to you weekly. If you'd like to stay up to date on our blogs, on our podcasts, even some of our social media, or if you would like to say hi to me, you can reach out to us at 480-531-9015. Again, that's 480-531-9015. We know that when leaders develop fulfillment in their own lives, that they begin to develop fulfillment in others. And when fulfilled leaders lead, they lead and develop hope. And the world needs a lot more hope. So here's the deal. We would love to see you next week. And let's lead full together.